All right, we are live. Today we're back to Morrowind and reading all the books in the game. Last time, I really struggled. Not with finding books too much, but with um no, that's not what I wanted to do. That's whatever. There we go. So how is that popping up? Okay. But, because I was like, you know, I'm level one here. Hadn't made any progress. And I was like, you know, I'm going to try to get some levels or something, but my character struggled heavily. So, watch your step. I'm going to have to figure out a way All right, I'm listening. to solve that a little bit. Does it strain my voice to read for so long? A little bit sometimes. Uh, by the end of the stream, my voice does feel a little bit strained. I've got a bunch of water and, you know, stuff, and that helps a little bit. Um... But yeah, it's a little bit, but it's fun and cool. I don't know. This is probably like Quickly, Outlander. my favorite series, of, you know, my favorite stream. It doesn't seem to be all that interesting for other people. <laughs> Too much. Or, you know, the quantity of people that are interested in this seems a lot less, but I don't know. This is like my favorite game series, so... And I love the lore for the game, so I love it. And I forgot about this. I never, you know, this, he, he gives you like 500 gold, I think. Hopefully. Or he doesn't. Wait, no, here we go. He gives you 200. Okay. That'll help a little bit. Okay. Uh. What may I do for you? War of the First Council. Have I read that one? I've read 42 books at this point, and I still... Ugh, making the list of books, you know, it's it's a very long list. So I haven't, I haven't quite gotten to finishing it. Uh, okay, so it was... Well, I mean, I could just start reading it, I guess. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, well, let's just start reading it. If it turns out I have, whatever. <clears throat> the War of the First Council. This account by the Imperial scholar Agrippa Fundili Fund Fundilius is based on various Imperial and Dunmer sources and written for Western readers. The War of the First Council was a First Age religious conflict between the secular Dunmer Houses, Dwemer and Dagoff, and the Orthodox Dunmer Houses, Indoril, Redoran, Dress, Hlalu, and Telvani. The First Council was the first pan-Dunmer governing body, which collapsed over disputes about sorceries and enchantments practiced by the Dwemer and declared profane by the other houses. The secular houses, less numerous but politically and magically more advanced, and aided by Nord and Orc clans, drawn by promise of land and booty, initially campaigned with great success in the north of Morrowind, and occupied much of the land now comprising Redoran, Vardenfell, and Telvani district. The Orthodox houses, widely dispersed and poorly organized, suffered a defeat after defeat, until Nerevar was made general of all house troops and le levies. Nerevar secured the aid of nomad tr barbarian tribesmen and contrived to force a major battle at the secular stronghold of Red Mountain on Vardenfell. The secular forces were outmaneuvered and defeated with the help of the Ashlander scouts, and the survivors forced to take refuge in the Dwemer strongholds at Red Mountain. 
After a brief siege, treason permitted Nervar and his troops to enter the stronghold, where the secular leaders were slain and Nervar mortally, mortally wounded. General slaughter followed, and the House Dwemer and Daoth were exterminated. Nervar died shortly thereafter of his wounds. Three of Nervar's associates among the Orthodox houses, Vivek, Almalexia, and Sothasil, succeeded to control succeeded to control of the recreated First Council, renamed the Grand Council of Morrowind, and went on to become the God Kings and the mortal rulers of Morrowind, known as the Tribunal or the Almsivi. How did I? Okay. I feel like such an idiot for not realizing Alamcv was just a different word for the tribunal. I can't believe I didn't know that. Oh my goodness. That feels like such basic. <laughs> like, of, oh my god. Because yeah, there's like a bunch of Alamcv stuff in like Alamcv temples. I was always like, what? What's Alamcv? That's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Cool. So that definitely wasn't a book I'd read before. More of the First Council. Alright, Cassades, you got anything? Any other books? That chest is trapped. He's got a bunch of drugs. But I think that is probably his only book. But, he did give us 200 gold, so. That's. That's kind of him. <laughs> Alright, so now that. Now, I can hopefully. Not waste all my money right away because part of the problem initially as well was probably that I spent all my money on books and didn't you know usually you're supposed to use some of that money for uh, you know better weapons and stuff like a, a regular person would um, you know on weapons spells and armor but I've got no armor and no spells so, let's go ahead and maybe get a little Conjuration spell. That should... That should be good enough to protect me at least a little bit. Let's see. So... She's got some Conjuration stuff, but those are bound weapons. Which actually... I might go for. Bound weapons are pretty strong. Bound longbow. Hmm. I haven't used any ranged weapons. Like, I've used yes. magic, but... What do you want? I've never actually used, like, bows or the throwing darts. Uh, spells, okay... He's got tons of restoration stuff. It looks like, which yeah, I don't really need right now. Except I could do with a restore health. That might be good. Ideally, I want. A conjuration spell, a destruction spell, a restoration spell. And that's probably good enough for now. Some skeleton million. Hmm. That's 300. Damn. Okay. Yeah, these spells are a bit too costly. Okay, 
And then she didn't... She had the... Does she have any spells? Okay, she's got... A bound spear. I might go for that. And she has soul trap. Hmm. Alright, we'll go for the bound spear for now. And then with the restoration spell. And that should be... Not I not the best, but... All right, I'm listening. Better than nothing. Let's see. Wait, do I... Hold on. Strength is a virtue, friend. Welcome. Yeah, okay. Barter... No, not barter. Spells. Soothing Palm. There we go. I Yeah, I just want to get my character at least a little bit set up. Right? So that... I can at least sort of manage. Um, you know, at this point I can't even fight a rat. Like a rat will kill me. I will struggle against a rat. And that is... That's yes, pretty... That's a bit sad and pathetic. Um, but what we can do for now is... Let's see. Let's do this... And this, and then brew a bunch of potions. Okay, we got nine restore fatigue potions. I don't think that makes up even close to how much I bought ingredients for. But that's just because I'm very low level. Um, so let's see. I made... Wait, did I make nine? I made these three. And I made these six. That only gets us 46. Wow. Okay. Oof. Okay. We're wasting a bit of money to level our alchemy. But, you know, we have leveled alchemy quite a bit here. It's already at level 10. I think it started at level 5. Which, oh, I shouldn't have. I put alchemy as a miscellaneous skill because I was like, oh, I can use it for, like, min-maxing. But that's, I don't know, why did I do that? That makes this, that makes the start so much, <laughs> so much more grindy. Alright, let's just... I just want to make sure that I can kill an enemy now. You know? If I get out a bound spear... Uh... Oh my god. If you look at the... The casting chance down there... That is so low. Um... I think that... Does the chance go up as you recover from fatigue? I think so. Hopefully... So, we'll also have to let fatigue recover a bit. And then we can... I just want to fight, like, maybe some some small little, little enemy. Alright, let's just run. I can drink a stamina potion. This also levels ac acrobatics, I suppose. I just need some little guy to fight. I just, I just, you know, I just want to make, you know, prove to myself that my character isn't absolutely pathetic. Yeah, there's not a lot of enemies very nearby. Well, I guess we can make our way over. I think I've already been to Fort Moonmoth. So... There's a decently strong enemy up that way, so maybe maybe I shouldn't go that way. Also, hold on. 
da, da, da. Wait, you can play with controller? Hold on, I didn't know the controller was easily usable here. That controller's not plugged in. I'm not gonna worry about it. <laughs> um Okay, I just I just need to find a little guy to fight. Come on. Where where's a little little scraggly guy? There should be something in this uh this area here. Hopefully we don't run anything into anything too high level. Ah, there's a rat. Okay, so let's go ahead and drink a Restore Fatigue Potion. Does that bring us all the way up? Might need to drink, drink too. Okay, we can just let it recover the rest of the way. Then we'll do magic. Oh, first try. Oh, damn. What the? Bounce spear? Is that strong? I mean, you know, I have a very low chance of, of it actually getting cast, but when it gets cast, it's, it's that powerful? That's crazy. Oh, my God. I mean, like, I get that I'm, like, low level, so it's, you know, and these enemies are kind of low level, but that's kind of crazy, actually. That's really cool. Okay, Bounce Spear is definitely a win. Early game especially, I suppose, Bounce Spear is real nice, because it is a full-on Daedric weapon. Come on. Just need one more hit. On, one hit. One hit. One hit. My spear. Oh wait, am I back to... Yeah, I'm back to the iron spear. Oh fuck. Okay. That's kinda... Failed. Failed. There we go, hell yeah. That works decently well. Okay, yeah, bounce beer for the win. Waiting here's illegal, what? Am I too close to Moonwell's fort? Come on. Come on, I just need to, just need to rest. All right, well, I can go back to town to rest, I suppose. But that's good proof of concept right there. Spear is going to work out with the bound weapons, and we can, at the very least, kill some, some weak enemies. That's good. Uh, so now we can go back to finding more books and reading. I just, you know... Having a level one character that can't do absolutely anything is, you know, isn't the best. Uh, so I wanted to be sure I could at least have some amount of, uh, of prowess and, you know, be able to defend myself at least a little bit. Let's see, how close am I to leveling up? Five out of ten. Okay. Halfway to leveling up. I don't know. I don't really focus too, pretty much at all on leveling up, I suppose. But yeah. Really the two... The main skills I really want to upgrade are Conjuration, but I think that that's going to come a little while later. I mean, not Conjuration, um, 
da, 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 da. enchanting. My enchanting's really the the skill that I need to upgrade the most. So, but early game enchanting is it's kind of impossible to do enchanting early game, as far as I know. Um. But, yeah. Alright, let's do- Oh, fuck! Oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, no. Wait, am I dead here? Can I drink a po- Can I drink a potion before death? No. Damn. You have my attention. Damn. That would have been so cool. I could have tested out if, uh... Let's try... Let's try Caldera. You want something? I could have tested out whether or not my spear would work against the assassin. That would have been really cool. Okay. Ash yams. Well... I should check... While I'm here, I'm gonna like you know look look what books they have, but I should also go ahead and check if they have any good uh, spells for sale. Invisibility for ten? Damn! What? This early on in the game? It's crazy. Invisibility for ten seconds on self. Damn! Really? That seems really. What? Damn. Okay. Uh, I got charm. Sound on time. I don't know what that does. Weakness spells. Chameleon. I mean, chameleon makes more sense with this early game, but the chameleon spell is more expensive? Huh. Oh, dude, Recall. That's a really good spell. That is definitely one I should get. Okay. But really? Invisibility? Okay, I mean... Damn. That's, sure <laughs> that seems crazy. Good day. Let's do business. Alright, let's see. What do we got? Mage's Guild Charter... Armor Eater, Bound, all the Bound stuff, Toes, Door Jam, Spirit Knife. Okay, she's got some summon spells, but they're all pretty, pretty expensive. Outlander. Do they have, do damn, want? they've got like no books here. 20, uh, 2,920 Hearth Fire. Uh, have I read this? It sounds familiar. But I think I've only read a similar similar book. Um, let's see, what was it? Permalizing. No, no, no. Yeah, I read 2920 Sun's Dawn. But I haven't read this one. 2920. Hearth fire. Here we go. Actually, let's take a take a sip first. Okay, time to read. Oh, my conjuration skill increased from that as well. That's cool. All right. Hearth fire, book nine of two thousand nine hundred and twenty, the last year of the first era, by Karlovac Townaway. Second Hearthfire, 2920. Gideon, Black Marsh. The Empress Tavia lay across her bed, a hot late summer wind she could not feel banging the shutters of her cell, to and fro against the iron bars. Her throat felt like it was on fire, but still she sobbed uncontrollably, wringing her last tapestry in her hands. 
Her wailing echoed throughout the hollow halls of Castle Gioves, stopping maids in their washing and guards in their conversation. One of her women came up the narrow stairs to see her mistress, but her chief guard, Zook, stood at the doorway and shook his head. She's just heard that her son is dead, he said quietly. Fifth Heart Fire, 2920, the Imperial City, Cyril. Your Imperial Majesty, said the Potente Versidu Shea through the door. You can open the door. I assure you, you're perfectly safe. No one wants to kill you. Ooh, is this about Dark Brotherhood? Sorry. Mara's blood, came the, came the Emperor Riemann III's voice, muffled hysterical and tinged with madness. Someone assassinated the prince, and he was holding my shield. They could have thought he was me. You're certainly correct, Your Majesty replied the potente, expunging any mocking qualities from his voice, while his black slitted eyes rolled contemptuously. We must finish and punish the evildoer responsible for your son's death, but we cannot do it without you. You must be brave for your empire. There was no reply. At the very least, come out and sign the order for La Lady Rij Rija's execution, called the potente. Let us dispose of the one traitor and assassin we know of. A brief pause, and then the sound of furniture scraping across the floor. Riemann opened the door, just a crack, but the Patente could see his angry, fearful face and the terrible mound of ripped tissue that used to be his right eye. Despite the best healers in the Empire, it was still a ghastly souvenir of the Lady Rija's work in Thurzo Fortress. Hand me the order, the Emperor snarled. I'll sign it with pleasure. Sixth Hearth Fire, 2920, Gideon, Cyrodiil. The strange blue glow of the Will-O-Wisps, a combination, so she'd been told, of swamp gas and spiritual energy, had always frightened Tavia. As she looked out her window, now it seemed strangely comforting. Beyond the bog lay the city of Gideon. It was funny, she thought, that she had never stepped foot in its streets, though she had watched it every day for seventeen years. Can you think of anything I've forgotten? She asked, turning to look back on the loyal Kothringi Zook. I know exactly what to do, he said simply. He seemed to smile, but the Empress realized that it was only her own face reflected in his silvery skin. She was smiling, and she didn't even realize. Make certain you aren't followed, she warned. I don't want my husband to know where my gold's been hiding all these years. And do take your share of it. You've been a good friend. The Empress Tavia stepped forward and dropped from sight into the mists. Zook replaced the bars on the tower window and threw a blanket over some pillows on her bed. With any luck, they would not discover her body on the lawn until morning, at which time he hoped to be halfway to Morrowind. Okay. Ninth Hearth Fire, 2920. Fergius Hyrock. The strange trees on all sides resembled knobby piles crowned with great bursts of red, yellows, and oranges, like insect mounds caught fire. The Rothgarain Mountains were fading into the misty afternoon. Turala marveled at the sight, so alien, so different from Morrowind. As she plodded the horse forward into an open pasture, behind her, head nodding against his chest, Cassier slept. Cradling, cradling bo bows reel. For a moment, Turala considered jumping the low-painted fence that crossed the field, but she thought better of it. Let, let Cassier sleep for a few more hours before giving him the reins. As the horses passed into the field, Turala saw the small green house on the next hill, half hidden in the forest. So picturesque was the image, she felt herself lull into a pleasant half-sleeping state. A blast of a horn brought her back to reality with a shudder. Cassier opened his eyes. Where are we? He hissed. I don't know, Tarilla stammered, wide-eyed. What is that sound? Orcs, he whispered. A hunting party. Head for the thicket quickly. Tarilla uh, trotted the horse into the small collection of trees. Cassier handed her the child and dismounted. He began pulling their bags off next, throwing them into the bushes. A sound startled then, started then, a distant rumbling, a footfall growing louder and closer. 
Tarula climbed off carefully and helped Kassir unburden the horse. All the while, Boisriel watched, open-eyed. Turalum sometimes worried that her baby never cried. Now she was grateful for it. With the last luggage, with the last of the luggage off, Kassir slapped the horse's rear, sending it galloping into the field. Taking Turala's hand, he hunkered down in the bushes. With luck, he murmured, they'll think she's wild or belongs to the farm and won't go looking for the rider. As he spoke, a horde of orcs surged into the field, blasting their horns. Turala had seen orcs before, but never, never in such abundance, never with such bestial confidence. Roaring with delight at the horses and its confused state, they hastened past the timber where Kassir and Turala and Basriel hit. The wildflowers flew into the air at their stampede, powdering the air with seeds. Turala tried to hold back his knees and th thought she succeeded. One of the orcs heard something, though, and brought another with him to investigate. Kassir quietly unsheathed his sword, mustering all the confidence he could. His skills as such they were, were in spying, not combat. But he vowed to protect Turala and her babe for as long as she could. Perhaps he would slay these two, he reasoned, but not before they cried out and brought the rest of the horde. Suddenly, something invisible swept through the bushes, like a wind. The orcs flew backwards, falling dead on their backs. Turala turned and saw a, wink a wrinkled crone with bright red hair emerge from a nearby bush. I thought you were going to bring them right to me, she whispered, smiling. Come with me. The three followed the old woman through a deep crevasse of brambled bushes that ran through the field toward the house on the hill. As they emerged on the other side, the woman turned to look at the orcs feasting on the remains of the horse, a blood-soaked orgy to the beat of multiple horns. That horse yours? she asked. When Cassier nodded, she laughed loudly. That's rich meat, that is. Those monsters will have belly aches and flatulence in the morning. Serves them right. Shouldn't we keep moving? Whispered Turala, unnerved by the woman's laughter. They won't come up here, she grinned, looking at Basriel, who smiled back. They're too afraid of us. Turala turned to Cassier, who shook his head. Witches. Am I correct in assuming that this is old Barbin's farm, the home of the Skeffington Coven? You are, pet, the old woman giggled girlishly, pleased to be so infamous. I am Minista Skeffington. What did you do to those orcs? asked Turala, back there in the thicket. Spirit, fist right side to the head, Minister said. Continuing the climb up the hill, ahead of them was the farmhouse grounds. A well, a chicken coop, a pond of women of all ages doing chores. The laughter of children at play. The old woman turned and saw that Turala did not understand. Don't you have witches where you come from, child? None that I know of, she said. There are all sorts of wilders of magic in Tamriel, she explained. The Sijiks study magic like it's their painful duty. The battle mages in the army on the other end of the scale hurl spells like arrows. We witches commune and conjure and celebrate. To fell those orcs, I merely whispered to the spirits of the air, Amaro, Pina, Talatha, the fingers of Kinareth, the breath of the world, with whom I have an intimate acquaintance, to smack those bastards dead. You see, conjuration is not about might, or solving riddles, or agonizing over musty old scrolls. It's about fostering relationships, being friendly, you might say. Well, we certainly appreciate you being friendly with us, said Kassir, as well you might be, coughed Minista. Your kind destroyed the orc homeland 2,000 years ago. Before that, they never came all the way up here and bothered us. Now let's get you cleaned up and fed. With that, Minista led them into the farm, and Turala met the family of Skeffington Coven. 11th Hearthfire, 2920. The Imperial City, Cyrodiil. Rija had not even tried to sleep the night before, and she found the somber music played during her execution to have a soporific effect. It was as if she was willing herself to be unconscious before the axe stroke. Her eyes were bound so she could not see her former lover, the emperor seated before her. 
glaring with his one good eye. She could not see the potente of her city's shay, his coil neatly wrapped beneath him, a look of triumph in his golden face. She could feel numbly the executioner's hand touch her back to steady her. She flinched like a dreamer trying to awake. The first blow caught the back of her head and she screamed. The next hacked through her neck and she was dead. The Emperor turned to the Patente wearily. Now that's done. You said she had a pretty sister in Hammerfell named Corda? 18. Hearthfire. 2,920. Dwinin High Rock. The horse the witches had sold him was not as good as his old one, Cassier considered. Spirit worship and sacrifice and sisterhood might be all well and good for conjuring spirits, but it tends to spoil beasts of burden. Still, there was little to complain about. With the Dunmer woman and her child gone, he had made excellent time. Ahead were the walls surrounding the city of his homeland. Almost at once, he was set upon by his old friends and family. How went the war? cried his cousin, running to the road. Is it true that Vivek signed a peace with the prince, but the emperor refuses to honor it? That's not how it was, was it? asked a friend, joining them. I heard the Dummer had the prince murdered, and then made up a story about a treaty, but there's no evidence for it. Isn't there anything interesting happening here? Cassier laughed. I really don't have the least interest in discussing the war, or Vivek. You missed the procession, procession of Lady Corda, said his friend. She came across the bay with full entourage, then east to the Imperial City. But that's nothing. What was Vivek like? asked his cousin eagerly. He's supposed to be a living god. If Shiogora steps down and they need another god of madness, he'll do, said Kassir haughtily. And the woman? asked the lad who had only seen Dummer ladies on very rare occasions. Kassir merely smiled. Turala Skeffington flashed into his mind for an instant before fading away. She would be happy with the coven and her child would be well cared for, but they were part of the past now a place and a war he wanted to forget forever. Dismounting his horse, he walked in, into the city, chatting of trivial gossip of life on the Iliac Bay. Hello, King A, and hello, Jasper, reading sim, essentially. This was a pretty long book, actually. I didn't think this one was going to be as good as it was. Because I read um twenty or I read two thousand nine hundred twenty, uh, Sun's Dawn. That was not all too interesting, but this one was pretty cool. Some interesting stuff here, like uh here we go. This guy here, Zook, he's a Kathringi, barely ever mentioned. You know the Kathringi. They're uh, pretty interesting. They're like people, but have silver skin for some reason. Then they live in the Black Marsh. So maybe the silver skin's an adaption to deal with the poison that's there? I don't know. So you're back with more problems. Oof. What now? What's going on with the shadow there? School. Okay, yeah. Well, you're in, like, online school, right? Aren't you? I don't like my school. I want to go to a new one, but which one? Or is that someone... You don't like your school. You want to go to a new one, but which one? I never had a choice in which school I, I was allowed to go to. Um, I... Yeah, my parents just made me go to whichever school they thought was the best for me. More so online or in person, there are good reasons for both. Well, I mean, in my opinion, in person is better. Good day. Let's do business. And like, I I don't think there's you know you don't have. I mean, you mentioned it yourself. There isn't much chance for socialization. In online school We're doing like zoom calls or whatever right and it's not very um... I 
Also, a college tier CS major. There's no in-person school that will have classes for me. Uh, I mean, you could do mixed. Right? You could keep doing your... Oof. Uh, you could keep doing... The... Uh, the college tier CS. Online. But damn, college tier CS... That's crazy. That's real cool. Uh, you could keep doing that online. And then do like the basic classes. Like English. Math and stuff. Uh, you don't think there's an in-person school that offers that? Um, there is. You just have to... Like they're not going to refuse. You know, okay. Let me put it this way. Look at it from a school's perspective, right? Um, there's a kid that's taken a, a college tier, a college tier class. You know, super smart. Are you gonna want him to attend your school or not? Like, they're gonna accommodate a, a little bit. You're fully self-taught in CS. Mm. Are you taking college tier CS classes online anyway? Like, if you're not taking college level classes online anyway, then give yourself taught. Dad yeah, was telling me the stuff I do now is what he was doing in third year college. No for CS, I'm not taking any classes. Okay, well then it doesn't really matter. Like what you could do. Hmm. Like for one thing, let me just say now, college class you know, school classes, they get harder as time progresses. So, but I'm not, honestly not too sure about that. Um, but what you could do, do, I mean, if you're not going to be taking the online classes anyway for CS, um, you just have to, like, whatever school you're going to, you just have to, like, go to the school counselor. Do I know what CS means? It's a fucking abbreviation, but I'm pretty sure... At first, I was thinking CSS, but that doesn't make sense. Um, but I'm guessing it's some coding language. Um, but, like, just go to your, like, you know, if you're in in-person school. Computer, oh, computer science, okay. Just, oh, man, why you gotta abbreviate everything? Damn, college level computer science? I mean, for computer science, you need like calculus, don't you? I don't know. Carpal tunnel from typing too much, right? Hmm, how can I? Am I still over encumbered? Damn. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, if you're in person school, you can just go to your, like, school counselor and talk to them about stuff and ask them if you could start, you know, figure out a way with the school counselor uh, how you could try to take some college classes. Because there's probably, like, a, um, there's probably, like, a community college nearby that offers online classes, and then you can, like, supplement your regular schooling with, uh, next year's, your next year is freshman year, so you can't mess this up. Yeah, I mean, just talk to your school counselor. Like, go, I mean, I would recommend going to a regular high school, or whatever, and then talking to the school counselor, and seeing if you could, um, uh, like, before the year starts, when they start making your schedule, which 
your next year is very soon. Um, you know, when they're making your schedule, ask them, hey, can I, su can I take some college classes for, like, you know, every school works differently, but, like, my school, you could take, uh, you could take college classes from the local community college online as, like, an elective. So, you can ask, hey, can I take some CS classes as an elective? And, um, your school counselor is definitely going to help you with that. Uh, I try to take DE, CS class, dual enrollment, which are high school that are as hard as college, and counter so. Yeah, pretty much. Just do that. Something like that. And, yeah, you can figure that. I mean, I did that a little bit as well. How can I get rid of 14 weight? to sell a bunch of this stuff. Good day. Let's do business. What is this about? Uh, I haven't thought about this. That would be so cool. Finishing high school with four years of DECS. Yeah, you could definitely work to do something like that. And that would be yeah, you know, that would definitely put you ahead. Outlander, what do you want? Good day. Let's and then you can still, you know, be in person and uh, be social. Where the heck are the beds? To, last to sleep so I can go to the to these shops. Are there no beds in here? The heck? I'm sure we can work out a okay. Price. I don't want. Teleport though. Uh, I think there's one seller at the very least that that I don't need that doesn't need daytime for. Um, it is it's in like a rundown mansion. If I can help, I will. This looks yes, Gorak Manor. Ooh, they've got a book. The Wolf Queen, Book Seven. I don't know if I can just take this. I'm gonna just. Uh... All right, I'm just gonna quick save. Surrender yourself. Okay, no, nope. I can't just take it, sadly. Let's go back. <laughs> we'll just read it. Okay. The Wolf Queen, Book 7. Alright. The Wolf Queen, Book 7, by Wagen... Oh, Wagen Jarth. Wagen Jarth is great. I love Wagen Jarth. From the pen of Inzolicus, 2nd century sage. 3rd era, 125. The exact date of the Empress Kintara Septim II's execution in the tower at Glenpoint Castle is open to some speculation. Some believe that she was slain shortly after her imprisonment in the 121st year, while others maintain that she was likely kept alive as a hostage until shortly before her uncle, Sephiroth, King of Galane, reconquered Western High Rock in the summer of the 125th year. The certainty of Kintara's demise rally rallied many against the Wolf Queen Patima and her son, who had been crowned Emperor Uriel Septon III four years previously when he invaded the underguarded Imperial City. Sephiroth concentrated his army on the war in High Rock, 
while his brother, Magnus, king of L Lilmoth, brought his Argonian troops through Loyal Morrowind and into Skyrim to fight in Patima's home province. The Reptilian troops fought well in the summer months, but during the winter they retired south to regroup and attack again when the weather was warm. At this stalemate, the war lasted at least two more years. Also, in the 125th year, Magnus' wife, Helena, gave birth to their first child, a boy who they named Pelagius, after the emperor who fathered Magnus, uh, Sepphoris, the late emperor Antiochus, and the dread wolf queen of solitude. Fatima sat on soft silk cushions in the warm grass in front of her tent and watched the sun rise over the dark woods on the other side of the meadow. It was a particularly vi it was a peculiarly vibrant morning, typical of Skyrim summertide. The high chirrup of insects buzzed all around her and the sky surged with thousands of following birds, rolling over one another, forming a multitude of patterns. Nature was unaware of the war coming to Falconstar. She surmised, Your Highness, a message has arrived from the army in Hammerfell, said one of her maids, bringing in a courier. He was breathing hard, stained with sweat and mud, evidence of a long, fast ride over many, many miles. My queen, said the courier, looking to the ground, I bring grave news of your son, the emperor. He met your brother, King Sephiroth's army in Hammerfell, in the countryside of Ichadag, and there did battle. You would be proud, for you fought well, but in the end, the Imperial Army was defeated, and your son, our Emperor, was captured. King Sephiroth is bringing him to Ghislaine. Patima listened to the news scowling. That clumsy fool, she said at last. Patima stood up and strolled into camp, where the men were arming themselves, preparing for battle. Long ago, the soldiers understood that their lady did not stand on ceremony, and she would prefer that they work rather than salute her. Lord Boken was ahead of her, already meeting with the commander of the battle mages, discussing last minute strategy. My queen, said the courier, who had been following her, what are you going to do? I'm going to win this battle with Magnus. Despite his superior position holding the ruins of Co Cogmanthus Castle, said Patima, and then when I know what Sephiroth means to do with the Emperor, I'll respond accordingly. If there's a ransom to be paid, I'll pay it. If there's a prison exchange needed, so be it. Now please bathe yourself and rest. Try not to get in the way of the war. It's not an ideal scenario, said Lord Vokan when Patima had entered the commander's tent. If we attack the castle from the west, we'll be running directly into the fire from their mages and archers. If we come in from the east, we'll be going through the swamps, and the Argonians do better in that type of environment than we do. A lot better. What about the north and south? Just hills, correct? Very steep hills, your highness said the commander. We should post Bowman there, but we'll be too vulnerable putting out the majority of our forces. So it's the swamp, said Patima, and added pragmatically, unless we withdraw and wait for them to come out before fighting. If we wait, Sephiroth will have his army here from High Rock, and will be trapped between the two of them, said Lord Vokan. Not a preferable situation. I'll talk to the troops, said the commander. Try to prepare them for the swamp attack. No, I'll speak to them. In full battle gear, the soldiers gathered in the center of camp. There were a motley collection of men and women, Cyrodiils, Nords, Bretons, and Dunmer, young bloods and old veterans, the sons and daughters of nobles, shopkeepers, serfs, priests, prostitutes, farmers, academics, and adventurers, all of them under the banner of the Red Diamond, the symbol of the imperial family of Tamriel. My children, Patima said, her voice ringing out, hanging in the morning mist, we have fought in many battles together, over mountaintops and beachheads, through forests and deserts. I have seen great acts of valor from each one of you, which does my heart proud. I have also seen dirty fighting, backstabbing, cruel and wanton feats of savagery, which pleases me equally well. For you are all warriors. Warming to her theme, Patima walked the line from soldier to soldier, looking each one in the eye. War is in your blood, in your brain, in your muscles, in your everything. You think in everything you do. When this war is over, when the forces are vanquished that seek to deny the throne to the true emperor, Uriel Septim III, you may cease to be warriors. You may choose to return your lives before the war, 
to your farms, to your cities, and show off your scars, and tell tales of the deeds you did this day to your wondering neighbors. But on this day, make no mistake, you are warriors, you are war. She could see her words were working. All around her, bloodshot eyes were focusing on the slaughter to come, arms tensing around weapons. She continued in her loudest cry, and you will move through the swamplands like an unstoppable power from the blackest part of oblivion, and you will rip the scales from the reptilian things in Cognathist Castle. You are warriors, and you need not only fight, you must win. You must win. The soldiers roared in response, shocking the birds from the trees all around the camp. From a vantage point on the hills to the south, Patima and Lord Vokan had excellent views of the battle as it raged. It looked like two swarms of two colors of insects moving back and forth over a clump of dirt, which was the castle ruins. Occasionally, a burst of flame or a cloud of acid from one of the mages would flicker over the battle, arresting their attention, but hour after hour, the fighting seemed like nothing but chaos. A rider approaches, said Lord Vokan, breaking the silence. The, run the young Redguard woman was wearing the crest of Ghislaine, but carried a white flag. Fatima allowed her to approach. Like the courier from the morning, the rider was well travel-worn. Your Highness, she said out of breath. I have, sent I have been sent from your brother, my Lord King Sepphoris, to bring you dire news. Your son Uriel was captured in Ichadag on the field in battle, and from there transported to Ghislaine. I know all this, said Patina scornfully. I have couriers of my own. You can tell your own master that after I've won this battle, I'll pay whatever ransom or exchange. Your Highness, an angry crowd, met the caravan your son was in before it made it to Ghislaine. The rider said quickly, Your son is dead. He had been burned to death within his carriage. He is dead. Bettina turned from the young woman and looked down at the battle. Her soldiers were going to win. Magnus's army was in retreat. One other item of news, your highness, said the rider. King Sepphoris is being proclaimed emperor. Patima did not look at the woman. Her army was celebrating their victory. Awesome. The wolf queen sounds pretty cool. Always interesting to see how... Because the previous one talked about Emperor Uriel Septim III a little bit, and him being super scared of an assassination attempt. I guess that's Queen Patina's son. Hmm. I haven't thought about this. Uh, that would be so cool, finishing high school with four years of these. Yeah. As it is, I'm struggling with my current classwork, but being in person would definitely help that. If the only other classes I'm taking are CS, then it would still be easy for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, being in person helps a lot. I definitely recommend it. All right, so if uh, okay, I think what's happening with the shadows is they're going through the floor for some reason. I don't know why. Yes. Okay, so creeper here is a very good good merchant. He's got five thousand gold. So, I can sell tons of stuff to him. I can dump a lot of this stuff on him and not worry about it. Because he will buy anything. So that'll definitely help. Lighten the load. I do kind of want to keep all my books. Oh wait, he doesn't buy ingredients? Huh. I didn't know that. What's with the symbols, Jasper? You don't buy that either. Okay, so I, I guess he only buys like junk and weapons, but he doesn't buy any potion ingredients. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and sell all that, I guess. YouTube block your brain fuck message, LMA. Oof. Alright, let's see if they've got any other books up here. In Gorak Manor. Say your words. 
Got a couple bed rolls, some jugs. What's going on with the shadow there? Is there another story above this one? There is. I don't think I've ever been. Ooh, Same book. Invocation of Sura, Book of Daedra. Okay. I think I've read this one, Book of Dawn and Dusk. Um, ba -ba -ba. I'm pretty sure it was like in the Mages Guild. I don't see it though. Maybe I haven't? You, was, you weren't watching live, Elmi? Oh. Yeah, I don't think I've read this. That's what the symbols... The symbols were? Okay. Alright, yeah, I don't think I've read this one. Oh, brain fuck. Right, the program language. Yeah. Yeah, I don't recognize Brainfuck at all. <laughs> uh, I've heard of it. I've seen, like, one example of it, and I was like, what the fuck, why would you do this? And never went back to it. I mean, you know, that's that's the point, but... Why? <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's, like... Isn't there, like, a guy would have spent, sent out Spells Out Nerd? Yeah. I am definitely a nerd. That's what a for loop looks like in Brainfuck? Damn. That's crazy. Like, at that- I mean, just use assembly at that point, honestly. <laughs> Even assembly is easier than brain fuck. I know that's the point, but man, brain fuck is. It is something. Closest thing it has to, to a four loop, right? Alright. Back to reading. The Book of Dawn and Dusk. Esoteric. Hmm? Yes. All these. A lot of. A couple of these books are. Esoteric, I suppose. The Book of Dawn and Dusk is a collection of sayings and aphorisms attributed variously to the tribunals and to their saints and servants. Many of these sayings have become... Wait, no, I have read this. I know I've read this. What the heck? Did I not write it down? <laughs> Oh, I did write it down. I just missed it. Okay, yeah, no, I've read this one. <laughs> but, there is one here. I haven't read this one. Yeah, no, I haven't read this one. Write this one down. Invocation. Oh, awesome. All right. Invocation of Azura by Sigilla Parate. For three hundred years, I've been a priestess of Azura. The Daedric Princess of Moonshadow, Mother of the Rose, and Queen of the Night Sky. Every Hagatham, which we celebrate on the 21st of the First Seed, we summon her for guidance, as well as to offer her things of worth and beauty to Her Majesty. She is a cruel but wise mistress. We do not invoke her on any Hagatham troubled by thunderstorms, for those knights belong to the Mad One, Shiogorath. 
Even if they do coincide with the occasion, Azura at such times understands our caution. Azura's invocation is a very personal one. I've been priestess to three other Daedric princes, but Azura values the quality of her worshippers and the truth behind our adoration of her. When I was a dark elven maid of 16, I joined my grandmother's coven, worshippers of Molag Bal, the schemer princess. What? Blackmail, extortion, and bribery are as much the weapons of the witches of Molag Bal as is dark magic. The invocation of D Molag Bal is held on the 20th of evening star, except during stormy weather. This ceremony is seldom missed, but Molag Bal often appears to her cultists in mortal guise on other dates. When my grandmother died in an attempt to poison the air of Firewatch, I re-examined my faith in the cult. My brother was a warlock of the cult of Boethia, and from what he told me, the dark warrior was closer to my spirit than the treacherous Molag Bal. Boethia is a warrior princess who acts more overtly than any other Daedroth. After years of skulking and scheming, it felt good to perform acts for, my, for a mistress which had direct, immediate consequences. Besides, I liked it that Boethia was a Daedra of the Dark Elves. Our cult would summon her on the day we called the gauntlet, the second of sun, the second of sun's dusk. Bloody competitions would be held in her honor, and the duels and battles would continue until the nine cultists were killed at the hands of the other cultists. Boethia cared little for her cultists; she only cared for our blood. I do think I saw her smile when I accidentally slew my brother in a sparring session. My horror, I think greatly pleased her. I left the cult soon after that. Boethia was too impersonal for me, too cold. I wanted a mistress of greater depth. For the next 18 years of my life, I worshipped no one. Instead, I read and researched. It was in a cold and profane tome that I came upon the name of Nocturnal. Nocturnal the Night Mistress. Nocturnal the Unfathomable. As the book prescribed, I called to her on her, hol on her holy day, the third, hearth the third of Hearthfire. At last, I had found the personal mistress I had so long desired. I strove to understand her labyrinthine philosophy, the source of her mysterious pain. Everything about her was dark and shrouded, even the way she spoke and the acts she required of me. It took years for me to understand the simple fact that I could never understand Nocturnal. Her mystery was as essential to her as savagery was to Boethia or treachery to Molag Bal. To understand Nocturnal is to negate her, to pull back the curtains cloaking her realm of darkness. As much as I loved her, I recognized the futility of unraveling her enigmas. I, inst I turned instead to her sister, Azura. Azura is the only Daedra princess I have ever worshipped who seems to care about her followers. Molag Bal wanted my mind, Boethia wanted my arms, and Nocturnal perhaps my curiosity. Azura wants all of that, and our love of all. Not our abject slavery, but our honest and genuine caring in all its form. It is important to her that our emotions be engaged in her worship, and our love must also be directed inward. If we love her and hate ourselves, she feels our pain. I will, for all times, have no other mistress. Damn, that's a very strong endorsement of Azura right there. Rocket League's a fire game. I should play it. I have played it before. I, <laughs> I, I mean, maybe it's... Uh, more, you know, maybe it's about not having played it enough and, you know, not being used to the controls, but I, I just could not control the, the car well. To, like, hit us, hit a ball. It is, it, it looks very cool, but, I don't know, I don't, I don't love competitive multiplayer Um, and the controls, I don't know, I'm trying to hit a, hit a ball with a car is quite challenging. I'm just going to save here 
and see if I can just use this. Oh, I can't sleep in someone else's bed. Damn. Okay. I guess we can't. Hmm. <laughs> oh, is that a book? What book is this? Night Falls on Sentinel. I don't recognize this one. Let's open it up. Okay, well, clearly, I haven't read it. Alright. Night Falls on Sentinel. Alright. <clears throat> Night Falls on Sentinel by Bowali. No music played in the nameless tavern in Sentinel, and indeed there was little sound except for discreet, cautious murmurs of conversation. The soft pad of the bar barmaid's feet on the stone, and the delicate slurping of regular patrons, tongues lapping at their flagons, eyes focused on nothing at all. If anyone were less otherwise occupied, the sight of the young redguard woman in a fine black velvet cape might have aroused surprise, even suspicion. As it were, the strange figure, out of place in an underground cellar so modest, dead no sign, blended into the shadows. Are you Jomic? The stout middle-aged man with a face older than his years looked up and nodded. He returned to his drink. The young woman took the seat next to him. My name is Habala, she said, and pulled out a small bag of gold, placing it next to his mug. Sure it be, snarled Jomic, and met her eyes again. Who'd you want dead? She did not turn away, but merely asked, Is it safe to talk here? No one cares about nobody else's problems but their own here. You could talk off your cuirass and dance bare-breasted on the table, and no one would even spit. The man smiled. So who do you want dead? No one, actually, said Abala. The truth is, I only want someone removed for a while. Not harmed, you understand. And that's why I need a professional. You come highly recommended. Who you been talking to? Asked Jomic, dully returning to his drink. A friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. One of them friends don't know what he's talking about, grumbled the man. I don't do that anymore. Abala quietly took out another purse of gold, and then another, placing them at the man's elbow. He looked at her for a moment, and then poured the gold out and began counting. As he did, he asked, Who'd you want removed? Just a moment, smiled Habala, shaking her head. Before we talk details, I want to know what you're a professional. I want to know that you're a professional, and you won't harm this person very much, and that you'll be discreet. You want discreet? The man paused in his counting. All right, I'll tell you about an old job of mine. It's been by, it's been by RK. I can hardly believe it. More than 20 years, and no one but me is alive who had anything to do with the job. This is back before the time of the War of Brittany. Bedney, remember that? I was just a baby. Of course you was, I smiled. Jomic smiled. Everyone knows that King Lothan had an older brother, Grecleth, who died, right? And then he's got his older sister, Ow Key? What married the, that king and fella in Daggerfall. But the truth that he had two elder brothers. Really? Habala's eyes glistened with interest. No lie, he chuckled. Weedy feeble fella called Arthago, the king and queen's firstborn. Anyhow, this prince was heir to the throne, which his parents wasn't all too thrilled about. But then the queen, she squeezed out two more princes, who looked a lot more fit. That's when me and my boys got hired on to make it look like their first prince got took off by the underking or some such story. I had no idea, the young woman whispered. Of course you didn't. That's the point, Jomic said, sh sh shaking his head. Discretion, like you said. We bagged the boy, dropped him off in an old ruin, and that was that. No fuss. Just a couple of fellas, a bag, and a club. That's what I'm interested in. Technique. My friend, who needs to be taken away, is weak. Also, like this prince, what is the club for? 
It's a tool. So many things, what was better in the past, ain't around no more. Just because people today prefer the ease of use to what works right, let me explain. There's 71 prime pain centers in an average fella's body. Elves and Khajiit, being so sensitive and all, got three and four more respectively. Argonians and Slodes, almost as, ma almost as many at 52 and 70 67. Jomic uses short stubby finger to point at each region on Habala's body. Six in your forehead, two in your brow, two on your nose, seven in your throat, ten in your chest, nine in your abdomen, three on each arm, twelve in your groin, four in your favored leg, five in the other. That's sixty-three, replied Habala. No, it's not, growled Jomic. Yes, it is, the young lady cried back, indignant that her mathematical skills were being put to question. Six plus two plus two plus seven plus ten plus nine plus three plus for one arm and three for the other, plus twelve, plus four, plus five. Sixty-three. I must have left some out, shrugged Jomic. The important thing is that to become skilled with a staff or club, you gotta be a master of these pain centers. Done right, a light tap could kill or knock out with out so much as a brood. Fascinating, smiled Habala, and no one ever found out? Why would they? The boy's parents, the king and the queen, they're both dead now. The other children, who always thought their brother got carried off by the under king, that's what everyone thinks. And all my partners are dead. Of natural causes? Ain't nothing natural that ever happens in the bay. You know that. One fella got sucked up by one of them Selenu. Another died of that same plague that took the king, that took the queen and Prince Grecklith. Another fella got hissed beat up. To death by a burglar, you gotta keep low, out of sight, like me, if you wanna stay alive. Jomic finished counting the coins. You must want this fella out of the way bad. Who is it? It's better if I show you, said Abala, standing up. Without looking back, she strode out of the nameless cavern. Tavern. Jomic drained his beer and went out. The night was cool with an unrestrained wind surging off the water of the Iliac Bay, sending leaves flying like whirling shards. Habala stepped out of the cavern alleyway to the, next to the tavern and gestured to him. As he approached her, the breeze blew upon, open her cape, revealing the armor beneath and the crest of the King of Sentinel. The fat man stepped back to flee, but she was too fast. In a blur, he found himself in an alley. On his back, the woman's knee pressed firmly against his throat. The king has spent years since he took the throne, looking for you and your collaborators, Jomic. His instructions to me, what to do when I found you, were not specific, but you've given me an idea. From her belt, Habala removed a small, sturdy cudgel. A drunk stumbling out of the bar heard a whimpered moan, accompanied by a soft whisper coming from the darkness of the alley. Let's keep better count of this time. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven. Bro, still reading? <laughs> I left the stream to go watch another stream. I came back and you're still reading. I'm gonna play a game this boring. You need subway surfers. Well, it's boring to you, but to me, this is way more interesting than any other game I've played. And I'm sure somewhere out there. There's others that are just as interested in this thing as me. And also, the game isn't boring. It's what I'm doing that's boring you in the game. Reading. Because people are very bored by reading. I guess. This is, yeah, to me, the most, the most fun and exciting uh, <laughs> thing to do in this game. Or, not really, but, you know, it is one of the most fun, you know, one of the most interesting aspects is all the lore that is available in this series of games. All right, ooh, more books. Ooh, he's got some. That's a cool looking bow as well. He's got quite a lot of books as well. Yes. 
Ooh, Frostmare robe. Bellops robe. That's pretty decent. It's also not all too costly. Might buy Veloth's robe there. Let's see. I've read that one. I've read that one. I'm I think I read that one. I haven't read that one. Go ahead, stranger. That one it's probably going to be at least slightly interesting. Uh, or, you know, it's going to be decently interesting. I'm probably going to know most of the stuff in that book because it's just an overview of gods and worship. Well, maybe not the worship part. I don't know much about that. I don't think I've read that. don't think I've read that. I might have read that. Right. Because I don't care too much. Or, you know... The biography of Baron's Eye is interesting, but the one that I'm more interested in, so, you know, it's interesting, I don't, I don't care about reading it out of order, though. The one that I don't really want to read in order is the, the true book? biography of Queen Baron's Eye. That one's the one I'm real interested in, because the, um, uh, because, yeah, the, the, Biography here, this one, the just plain biography, that one is um, basically all lies. Or, you know, it's like a fantastical uh, retelling. Or not fantastical, but, you know, it's like a, what's it called, like a whitewashing of the story. Which, you know, is interesting, but... Not exactly what I'm looking for. Okay, and then there's even more here. Even more books. Okay, Brief History of the Empire. That's like everywhere. I've already read that. Firmament. True Noble's Code. Some paper. Okay. Wait. Okay. Let's start off by talking with this guy. And seeing if maybe there's some stuff I want to buy from him. I've got 350 gold. It's not a lot. Um, but I think he's got some cool stuff. Let's see, how much is this? 110. That's decent. Uh... I mean, it's got a decent enchant. I do want to do enchanting myself, but I'm too low level for that right now that I'm pretty much not going to be able to do any enchanting. And then Veloth's robe here is pretty decent. We're so back. I think you might be slightly disappointed because I'm gearing up to read. <laughs> the whole point of the stream for Morrowind is reading. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I'll probably get this robe. Value 19. And then I can get the spear as well. Uh, you're gearing up to read? Why do you need to gear up for that? Oh, no, no, no I'm not. <laughs> That's funny. I accidentally made a pun, I suppose. No, I'm like about to start reading. I'm just doing this first because he's here. So let's buy this and buy this. Um, and then let's sell some of my stuff here. Cause there's a bunch of books in this shop that I want to read. Brother's getting his chest plate max so he can read the final boss. Yeah, pretty much. I might need to steal some books. Actually, because I do want to, like, collect all the books. I don't know if I'm going to end up even doing that. But, you know, there's some books that are in, like, dungeons. Like the, um, I'm pretty sure, like, some of the Dunmer books you can only get in Dunmer Ruins, which, you know, as a low-level character, you can't go into without dying right away. 
All right, let's just sell a lot of these ingredients. Let's just sell all these ingredients. Actually, hold on. Salt trees, I should keep that. Yeah, there's... I haven't made an audiobook yet. I haven't. Audiobooks take a long, long time to do. I haven't even... Uh, decided what book I want to want to I want to read. Wasted potential. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do want to do it. Um, I was thinking about picking out a book from like Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg. No, to avoid any any type of copyright infringement. But I uh, don't buy that. Okay. Yeah, I definitely do want to do an audiobook. This, this series is also like preparation, or you know, not, not quite pre preparation, but like, um, you know, practice for making audiobooks, because pretty much this whole thing is just mini, a bunch of mini audiobooks. Very small ones, because all the books in this game are super short. But there we go. Got a decent robe now. Let's see. Let's go with overview of gods and worship. I think this is going to be interesting. Anyway, meet any new friends in the last 12 hours? No. <laughs> Where would I have met new friends? Crazy? Are you expecting me to make new friends all of a sudden? It's a joke. Oh. God and worship. unrealistic time frame i mean if i you know if it's a challenge make a new friend in 12 hours that's possible but just randomly new friend in 12 hour in the last 12 hours that's a bit challenging but i did mention my uh my one friend who i wasn't receiving text messages back from has written me back so we're good again and we're hanging out in two weeks. She likes me. She doesn't. <laughs> two weeks. Dang, you're busy. Yeah. Dude. Super busy. I mean, she's also super busy. Two weeks, that's pretty soon. Usually we schedule like a month in advance. But... <sighs> Only two weeks of preparation? Of course she likes you. She's friends with you. She has to like you at least a little. Oh, no, I thought you were, like, doing the she likes you in that way. My brain is on the previous yesterday's conversation, I guess. Um. Death? Date her? No. <laughs> Why? <laughs> We have data before. I'm not all too interested in doing that again. And I don't think she is either. We friend zoned each other. Alright, let's read this. Rip, we'll keep reading books, nerd. I will. I will gladly read these books, because these books are very interesting. Alright. An Overview of Gods and Worship in Tamriel by, by Brother Hetchfield. Hetchfeld. Editor's Note. Brother Hetchfeld is an associate scribe at the Imperial University, Office of Introductory Studies. 
Gods are commonly judged upon the evidence of their interest in worldly matters. A central belief in the active participation of deities in mundane matters can be challenged by the reference to apparent apathy and, indifer and indifference on the part of the gods during times of plague or famine. From intervention and legendary quests to manifestations in common daily life, no pattern for the gods of Tamriel activities is readily perceived. The concerns of gods in many ways may seem unrelated or at best unconcerned with the daily trials of the mortal realm. Exceptions do exist, however. Many historical records and legends point to the direct intervention of one or more gods at a time of great need. Many heroic tales recount blessings of the divinity bestowed upon heroic figures who worked or quested for the good of the deity or the deity's temple. Some of the more powerful artifacts in the known world were originally bestowed upon their, own, upon their owners through such reward. It has also been reported that priests of high ranking in their temples may on occasion call upon their deities for blessings or help in time of need. The exact nature of such contact and the blessings bestowed is given to much speculation, as the temples hold such associations secret and holy. This, is di this direct contact gives weight to the belief that the gods are aware of the mortal realm. In many circumstances, however, these same gods will do nothing in the face of suffering and death, seeming to feel no need to interfere. It is thus possible to conclude that we, as mortals, may not be capable of understanding more than a small fraction of the reasoning and logic such beings use. One defining characteristic of all gods and goddesses is is their interest in worship and deeds. Deeds in the form of holy quests are just one of the many things that bring the attention of deity. Deeds in everyday life by conforming to the statutes and obligation the statutes and obligations of individual temples are commonly supposed to please a deity. Performances of ceremony in a temple may also bring a deity's attention. Ceremonies vary according to the individual deity. The results are not always apparent, but sacrifice and offerings are usually required to have any hope of gaining a deity's attention. While direct intervention on a daily, in daily temple life has been recorded, the exact nature of the presence of a god in daily mundane life is a subject of controversy. A traditional saying of the Wood Elves is that one man's miracle is another man's accident. While some gods are believed to take an active part of daily life, others are well known for their lack of interest in temporal affairs. It has been theorized that gods do in fact gain strength from such things as worship, through praise, sacrifice, and deed. It may even be theorized that the number of worshippers a given deity has may reflect on his own personal position among the other gods. This, my own conjecture, garnered from the apparent ability of the larger temples to attain blessings and assistance from their gods with greater ease than smaller religious institutions. There are reports of the existence of spirits in our world that have the same capacity to use the actions and deeds of mortals to strengthen themselves, as do the gods. The understanding of the exact nature of such creatures would allow us to understand with more clarity the connection between a deity and the deity's worshippers. The implication of the existence of such spirits leads to the speculation that these spirits may even be capable of raising themselves to the level of a god or goddess. Uh, Motuso of the Imperial Seminary has suggested that these spirits may be the remains of gods and goddesses who through the time lost all or most of their following, reverting to their earliest, most basic form. Practitioners of the old ways say that there are no gods, just greater and lesser spirits. Perhaps it is possible for all three theories to be true. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yep. For me, I like to like to go with all three theories at once. But yeah. You're bored. I'm sorry. I to me this is very interesting, but I, I know it's not interesting the most interesting for for a lot of other people all right let's see well where did I children of the sky I don't think I've read that one it's 
make sure though. Oh, where did I put that? Actually, let's go and open and turn oh, to the first page. Good. Yeah, no, I haven't read that one. Children of the Sky Nords consider themselves to be the children of the sky. They call Skyrim the throat of the world, because it is where the sky exhaled on the, on the land and formed them. They see themselves as eternal outsiders and invaders, and even when they conquer and rule another people, they feel no kinship with them. They breathe and the voice are the the breath and the voice are the vital essence of a Nord. When they defeat great enemies, they take their tongues as trophies. These are woven into ropes and can hold speech like an enchantment. The power of a Nord can be articulated into a shout, like the ki of an Akaviri swordsman. The strongest of their warriors are called tongues. When the Nords attack a city, they take no siege engines or cavalry. The tongues form in a wedge in front of the gatehouse and draw in breath. When the leader lets it out in a ki, the doors are blown in and the axemen rush into the city. Shouts can be used to sharpen blades or to strike enemies. A common effect is the shout that knocks an enemy back, or the power of command. A strong Nord can instill bravery in men with his battle cry, or stop a charging warrior with a roar. The greatest of the Nords can call to specific people over hundreds of miles and can move by casting a shout, appearing where it lands. The most powerful Nords cannot speak without causing destruction. They must go gagged and communicate through, sign lang through a sign language and through inscribing runes. The further north you go into Skyrim, the more powerful and elemental the people become, and the less they require dwellings and shelters. Wind is fundamental to Skyrim and the Nords. Those that live in the far wastes always carry a wind with them. No more books. Goodbye. I'm leaving the stream to go watch YouTube about CS. Alright. Have fun with that. Alright. Dude, I wish they lean a lot further into... Into this. In Skyrim. Like, oh, dude. Like, Skyrim, the, you had, like, the gray beards, and then you're the main character that could do shouts. You know, that, that could do the, um... But there, you know, there's there's no tongues. There's no taking out people's tongues and then turning them into enchantments that can hold a shout. There's no... The further, like, the further north you go into Skyrim, the more powerful and elemental the people come, and the less they require dwellings and shelters. Not at all the case in Skyrim. In the game, at least. You know, it's... it's oh, dude, the Nords had such cool lore set up for them. And honestly, I feel like Skyrim really squandered it. They had so much cool lore. Like, the, you just have the Greybeards. Like, that's all that remains. And then, like... Well, I guess, uh, Ulfric Stormcloak, he can do shouts. He barely does it. Like, why? Why did they scrap that idea? So hard. Shouts would've been, like, I don't know. It would've been, it would've been a lot cooler. Like, they just turned Skyrim into, like, the typical Nordic fantasy country rather than like being unique and you know I don't know I feel like they could have done so much more the wit the Nords but instead they're just like typical Vikings cause yeah I mean they had such cool lore set up for them alright let's see let's Madness of Pelagius. Uh, 
don't think I've read this. It doesn't look super familiar. I feel like I've read something about Pelagius. Um, but I don't think it's this book. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think so. All right. Let's add it to the list. All right. I'm so mad. The internet sucks. People always say it's full of people, but I'm banned everywhere you go. It's not full of people. It's the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I barely interact, so I, I'm not banned anywhere. Uh, but, I don't know. Could be the, um, uh, what is it called? The, like, bot theory? That everyone online is just a bot? How do I know all the people in chat aren't just all bots? Could be. Could be advanced AI. Or at this point, not even advanced. Back in, you know, a couple of years back, it would have been advanced AI, I guess, but... You know, everybody online could just be a bunch of AI. But, yeah, that sucks. That sucks that <laughs> you're banned everywhere you go. No shitties on to us. I mean, in my head, I just pretend everyone is AI in chat. You know, keeps me from getting too anxious, you know, about, you know, <laughs> having social anxiety or whatever. If I just imagine that everyone's an AI. You know how people, you know, people used to say, oh, just imagine everyone, you know, when you're doing, like, public speaking, imagine that everyone is, like, a potato, or imagine that everyone is naked when you're doing public speaking to, like, deal with your nerves. I've adapted that. Just imagine everyone's AI. You know, it works perfectly. Alright. The Madness of Pelagius. By Tsath... Ugh, man, these names. Tsathenes. The man who would be emperor of all Tamriel was born Thoris Pelagius Septim, a prince of the royal family of Wayrest in Third Era 119. At the end of the glorious reign of his uncle Antiochus I, Wayrest had been showered by much preference during the years before Pelagius' birth, for King Magnus was Antiochus' favorite brother. It is hard to say when Pelagius' madness first manifested itself, for in truth, the first ten years of his life were marked by much insanity in the land itself. When Pelagius was just over a year old, Antiochus died and a daughter, Kintira, assumed the throne to the acclaim of all. Kintira II was Pelagius' second a uh, cousin and an accomplished mystic and sorceress. If she had sufficient means to peer into the future, she would have surely fled the palace. The story of the War of the Red Diamond has been told in many other scholarly journals, but as most historians agree, Kintira II's reign was usurped by her and Pelagius' cousin Uriel by the power of his mother, Patima, the so-called Wolf Queen of Solitude. The year after her coronation, Kintira was trapped in Glenpoint and imprisoned in the Imperial Dungeons there. All of Tamriel exploded into warfare as Prince Uriel took the throne as Uriel III, and High Rock, because of the imprisoned Empress's absence there, was the location of some of the bloodiest battles. Pelagius' father, King Magnus, allied himself with his brother Sepphoris against the usurper Emperor and brought the wrath of Uriel III and Queen Patima down on Wayrest. 
Pelagius and his brothers and sisters, and his mother Euthela, fled to the Isle of Balfiera. Euthela was of the line of Dereni, and her family manse is still located on that ancient isle, even to this day. There is thankfully much written record of Pelagius' childhood in Balf Balfiera, recorded by the nurses and visitors. All who met him described him as a handsome, reasonable boy, interested in sport, magic, and music. Even assuming the diplomat's lack of candor, Pelagius seemed, if anything, a blessing to the future of the Septim dynasty. When Pelagius was eight, Sephiroth slew Uriel III at the Battle of Ichadag and proclaimed himself Emperor Sephiroth I. For the next ten years of his reign, Sephiroth battled Patima. Pelagius' first battle was the Siege of Solitude, which ended with Patima's death and the final end of the war. In gratitude, Sephiroth placed Pelagius on the throne of Solitude. As King of Solitude, Pelagius' eccentricities of behavior began to be noticeable. As a favorite nephew of the Emperor, a few diplomats to Solitude made critical commentary about Pelagius. For the first two years of his reign, Pelagius was at the very least noted for his alarming shifts in weight. Four months after taking the throne, a diplomat from Ebenhart called Pelagius a hale and hearty soul with a heart so big it widens his waist. Five months after that, the visiting princess of Firsthold wrote to her brother that the king has gripped my hand and it felt like I was being clutched by a skeleton. Pelagius is greatly emancipated indeed, emaciated indeed. Sephiroth never married and died childless three years after the Siege of Solitude. As the only surviving sibling, Pelagius' father Magnus left the throne of Wayrest and took residence at the imperial city as the Emperor Magnus I. Magnus was elderly and Pelagius was his oldest living child, so the attention of Tamriel focused on Sentinel. By this time, Pelagius' eccentricities were becoming infamous. There are many legends about his acts as King of Sentinel, but few well-documented well cases exist. It is known that Pelagius locked the young princess, princes and princesses of Sylvanar in his room with him, only releasing them when an unsigned declaration of war was slipped under the door. When he tore off his clothes during a speech he was giving at a local festival, his advisors apparently decided to watch him more carefully. On the orders of Magnus, Pelagius was married to the beautiful heiress of an ancient dark elf noble family, Katariah Rathim. Nordic kings who marry dark elves seldom improve their popularity. There are two reasons most scholars give for the union Magnus was trying to cement. Relations with Ebonhart, where the Rathim clan hailed, Ebonhart's neighbor, Mornhold, had been a historic ally of the Empire since the very beginning, and the royal consort of Queen Berenzaya had won many battles in the War of the Red Diamond. Ebonhart had a poorly kept secret of aiding Uriel III and Patima. The other reason for the marriage was more personal. Katariah was as shrewd a diplomat as she was beautiful. If any creature was capable of hiding Pelagius' madness, it was she. On the 8th of the Second Seed, Third Era, 145, Magnus I died quietly in his sleep. Joleth, Pelagius' sister, took over the throne of Solitude, and Pelagius and Katariah rode to the Imperial City to be crowned. Emperor and Empress of Tamriel. It is said that Pelagius fainted when the crown was placed on his head, but Katariah held him up so only those closest to the thrones could see what had happened. Like so many of Pelagius' stories, this cannot be verified. Pelagius III never truly ruled Tamriel. Katariah and the Elder Council made all the decisions and only tried to keep Pelagius from embarrassing all. Still, stories of Pelagius III's reign exist. It was said that when the Argonian ambassador from Black Rose came to court, Pelagius insisted on speaking on all, in all grunts and squeaks, as that was the Argonian's natural language. It is known that Pelagius was obsessed with cleanliness, and many guests reported walking to the noise of an early morning sundown of the Imperial Palace. The legend of Pelagius's, Pelagius while inspecting the servant's work, suddenly, suddenly defecating on the floor to give them something to do, is probably apocryphal. 
When Pelagius began actually biting and attacking visitors to the Imperial Palace, it was decided to send him to a private asylum. Cataria was proclaimed regent two years after Pelagius took the throne. For the next six years, the emperor stayed in a series of institutions and asylums. Traitors to the empire have many lies to spread about this period. Whispered stories of hideous experiments and tortures performed on Pelagius have almost become accepted as fact. The noble lady, Cataria, became pregnant shortly after the empire emperor was sent away, and rumors of infidelity, and even more absurd, conspiracies to keep the same emperor locked away ran amok. As Cataria proved her pregnancy came about after a visit to her husband's cell, with no other evidence, as loyal subjects were bound to accept the emperor's, empress's word on the matter. Her second child, who had reigned for many years as Ural IV, was the child of her union with her consort Lariat, and publicly acknowledged as such. On a warm night in sun's dawn in his 34th year, Pelagius III died after a brief fever in his cell at the Temple of Kinnereth in the Isle of Bethany. Cateri I reigned for another 46 years before passing the scepter on to the only child she had with Pelagius, Cassander. Pelagius' wild behavior has made him perversely dear to the province of his birth and death. The second of the sun's dawn, which may or may not be the anniversary of his death, records are not very clear, is celebrated as Mad Pelagius, the time when foolishness of all sorts is encouraged. And so, one of the least desirable emperors in the history of the Septum Empire has become one of the most famous ones. Always how it goes. <clears throat> what you don't want to become famous ends up becoming famous. That's, uh, what is it? The, I mean, not quite, but similar to the Streisand effect, I suppose. What's this about? Man, my throat is sore as shit. And it was a lot of reading. Ooh, okay. So let's see, how many books have I read today? So, I read The War of the First Council, 2000. Uh, 920 Hearthfire, The Wolf Queen, Book 7, Invocation of Azure, A Night Falls on the Sentinel, An Overview of Gods and Worship, Children of the Sky, and the Madness of Pelagius. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 books. So that means I've read 50, 50 of the books in Morrowind. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's like 300 or something like that. So that is not very far. Let's hear it. Um, but, better than nothing, I suppose. But, yeah. I am, yeah, <laughs> my sword, de my throat definitely does get sore by the end of each of these streams. But yeah, some interesting lore. Shadows are not behaving very properly, are they? Might need to change some settings with the shadows in OpenMW. Um, but yeah, like the the, worshiping the Daedra. It's kind of funny. Like, uh, so whenever, so the worship day for each of the Daedra. It said for each of those, if it's uh, if it's thundering on that day, they don't worship that Daedra, because that's a day for Shagorath. That seems kind of, I don't know, it's kind of funny. They just, if it's ever, if there's ever thunder, every Daedra just yields to Shagorath, it seems. Even Molek Ball. Yeah, we made good progress today. Got another set of books read, and we also figured out a decent way, at least, you know, with a Daedric Spear like this, to be able to defend myself. Because before I couldn't even beat a rat, but now with this Daedric Spear, Conjured Spear, I'm able to do quite a bit of damage and not have to worry 
Actually, hold on. I kind of want to see if I could beat one of these things up. Let's see. Okay. I, if, if I can beat up one of these guys with a, with a conjured spear, that would be kind of OP. Because this is like super early game. I'm like level one. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I can. Oh, wait, no. Holy shit, what? I just need to actually hit them, but... Come on. Oof. Okay. I could. If it was just one of them, I'd probably be able to kill them. Okay, hold on. I'm pretty sure I can. Like, part of the issue here... Well, I guess I could drink a... Uh, Store fatigue potion here. That'll help as well. And I do need to actually... Damn. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's possible I get, if it's two of them. But... But... Daedric Spear does... Does do a lot of damage. Damn. Let's see if there's just one of them out in the open. No, not, not quite. Yeah, I don't think I can take two at a time. Because I am, I mean, I could maybe take one, and I'm only level one. I feel like, I don't know. It seems like conjuration with just being able to summon a Daedric Spear. It's really OP early game. Like, late game, it's... <laughs> you know. Late game, it's not impressive at all. But early game? Oh, it's just an ancestral tomb. Alright. That is gonna do it for today. I hope you guys had a good time. I always enjoy reading books in Morrowind, so I definitely did. But, yeah, have a nice night, nice day, whatever time zone you're in. And, yeah, peace.